I want to read now just two verses from 1 John chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. 1 John 5, verse 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Amen. And the Lord again will bless that short reading from His Word, and it is His Word inspired and fallible. The title we have given to our ministry theme today is blessed assurance. When you read the letter of 1 John, you never have to wonder why John was writing. He makes it very clear time and time again why he's writing this epistle. For example, in chapter 1, verse 4, John explains his purpose in writing like this, And these things write we unto you, that your joy might be full. John wants the Christian to be filled with joy, to have a joyful Christian life. In chapter 2, verse 1, he gives a second reason for his letter. He says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye might sin not. Another purpose of his letter is to discourage sin in the life of the Christian. Other examples in the letter that explain the purpose of its writing are found in chapter 2, verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Verse 21 of the same chapter, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and no lie is of the truth. Verse 26, he says, same chapter, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. And then as we come to the end of the letter, we find him declaring another reason for his writing this epistle. In chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that you might believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. John states that one of his goals for writing is to help believers to be certain, to be certain that they have eternal life. As I have said in one of our earlier studies, that the Gospel of John was written that we might know how to be saved. The letter of the first epistle of John was written to tell us how we might know that we are truly saved eternally. It's a privilege of every Christian to be able to say with Fanny Crosby of old, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. The promise of the Lord Jesus Christ still stands sure. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 15. And John wants us to be certain that we are not perishing, but we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. So let's look at verses 12 and 13 and see what John has to say about the Christian's assurance of eternal life. Verse 11, he speaks of the source of eternal life. And this is a testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. In the opening words of the letter, John pointed us to the Lord Jesus. And as he comes to the conclusion of the letter, he's still pointing people again to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He began the letter by calling him the Word of Life, chapter 1, verse 1. In the end, he reminds us that he is the one who is not only the word of life, but he is the one who gives to us eternal life. 
Now, eternal life is not a program. It's not a performance. It's in a person, Jesus Christ. In verse 11, John says, Jesus is the source of eternal life. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life, here's the source, is in his Son. And as we look at these verses, we don't see any new truths introduced by John. But it's only in repeating, reiterating truths he has constantly stated throughout the letter we have been looking at together. First we see in his words, what is required for salvation? Well, that takes me back and thought to Acts 16. The Philippine jailer asked the question, What must I do to be saved? Acts 16.30. And Paul's answer was, verse 31 of Acts 16, they replied, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now as we look at John's words, we see the echoing of the same requirement for salvation. Verse 10, John speaks of he that believes on the Son of God. Verse 13, he speaks of those that believe on the name of the Son of God. So John tells us very clearly that salvation is an act of faith. It's an act whereby a person puts their trust in Christ to be their Savior. Salvation, we've said it before, cannot be earned by good works or by religious deeds or having a good character or doing your best in life. John does not give us a list of do's and don'ts, but tells us that salvation is to be found in Jesus Christ plus nothing and minus nothing. On the Eldergate Street in London, it was there that John Wesley, who had preached for years, rested in his work for salvation. He thought he had to work for salvation. He was preaching. But he believed in Jesus Christ totally for salvation. And describing his own experience, he wrote, the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I really did trust Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And the assurance was given to me. He has taken away my sin, every sin of mine. He has saved me from the law of sin and from death. He realized the works could never, ever save a soul. What is required for salvation? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou will be saved. John said in verse 11, He that hath the Son of life, and he that hath not the Son of God, hath not life. Now John keeps it very simple. He gets straight to the point. If you have accepted by faith Christ as your Savior, you are saved. And if not, you are still in your sins. It's as clear as that. And God has repeatedly gone on record and declared that salvation comes by believing in his Son, Jesus Christ. John states in verse 10 of this chapter, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he does not believe in the testimony that God has given of his Son. To say salvation is by any other way it's just like calling God a liar. So we have the source of eternal life. But we also see in John's words the substance of eternal life. What is received at salvation? Verse 12, John says, He who has the Son has life. Has the Son means to possess the Son in a sense that he is present every day in one's life. To be saved is to possess within your being 
the eternal one. In the first words of his letter, John declared Jesus to be from the beginning. That was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon with our hands and handled concerning the word of life. Jesus, word of life. Therefore, to have the Son is to have life, but not only life, eternal life. And as we see in verse 11, when a person accepts Christ as Savior, they are actually given eternal life. When W.B. Henson, a preacher of a past generation, speaks from his own experience, just before he died, he said, I remember a year ago what the doctor told me. You have an illness from which you won't recover. I then walked out from where I lived, and I looked across the mountains that I loved. I looked down at the river, which I rejoiced, having been there so often. I looked around at the stately trees that are always the portrait of God to my soul. Then in the evening, I looked up into the great sky where God was lighting his lamps, and I said, I may not see you many more times, but mountain, I shall be alive when you are gone. River, I shall be alive when you cease running towards the sea. Stars, I shall be alive when you have fallen from your sockets in the great downpulling of the material universe. Eternal life speaks of a quality of life one experiences in this world, but it also speaks of something that's everlasting. It will last throughout the ages of eternity. The eternal life, once given to us, we can never, ever lose it. Because we have eternal life, that means we are eternally secure. And John wants us to live in the blessing of knowing we have eternal life and it is well with our soul. The source of eternal life and the substance of eternal life, the surety of eternal life. John uses this word no 39 times in his letter. It is obvious that there are certain things he wants the believer to know to be sure of. And one thing he wants us to know is to be sure that we are saved. He doesn't want the Christian just to hope that they are saved. And at the end of the day, things will turn out all right for them. He wants them to know that they are saved. Verse 13 these things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know, underline it in your Bible, that you might know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. When Sir James Simpson, the man who discovered chloroform, was on his deathbed, a friend asked him the question, Sir, what are your speculations now? And Simpson replied, Speculations? I have no speculations, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Christian friend, listen. Believers don't have to go through life hoping they are saved. John says they can know they are saved. I once read of a man who said he was so saved that he could swing over hell on a rotten grapevine and sing victory to Jesus. 
That's the way, friends, we should live. That's the way we should die. This is a kind of assurance the Bible tells us we can have. In John's words, we see a salvation that is sure. John is speaking of knowing that we have eternal life. And the word know simply means to be aware and to be sure we have eternal life. When a person says they know that they are saved, they're saying that they're aware that God has saved them. And there's no doubt in their minds whether they're saved or not. They are totally saved because they've taken God at his word. There's a little town in Texas that's called Uncertain. The site is near a place called Uncertain Landing, and so named because the steamboat captains in the earlier days often had trouble mooring their vessels there. It was also on the site of an old hunting, fishing and boating society that was called the Uncertain Club. It existed there in the early 1900s. The Uncertain Club. There are many people today who live in the spiritual town of Uncertain and they're paid up members of the Uncertain Club, spiritually speaking. And there's nothing good you can say about the spiritual town of Uncertain. There's nothing good you can say about the uncertain club of believers who are not sure they're saved. It's a miserable condition to live in. However, it's an unnecessary condition to live in. Again, John is telling us that we can know that we're saved. We can sing with Fanny Crosby, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. We can declare with absolute assurance we've been saved by the grace of God because eternal life is living in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. I read about a little boy who was standing on the side of the road when a stranger came up who was lost. And he said to the boy, Tell me, how do you get to town? Little boy says, I don't know. Well, tell me, where does this road go to? Little boy says, I don't know. Well, can you tell me what's the name of this road I'm on? And the boy says, I don't know. And the man says, boy, don't you know anything? Little boy replied, I know I'm not lost. I may not know a lot of things, but this one thing I do know. I'm not lost, but you are. Friends, we can know we're saved. It's because we have a salvation that is secure, a salvation that is sure to have eternal life. The word eternal means perpetual. It's an ongoing thing. It describes a life that's everlasting. The Bible doesn't say salvation is temporary. What kind of salvation would that be? It declares it's eternal. Our salvation is an everlasting salvation. No doubt the reason John tells us that we know that we're saved because of what he heard the Lord say on many different occasions. In the Gospel of John, he records on different occasions things Jesus said describing the security of our salvation. One familiar one, John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Friends, we are in the hands of God if you are saved. You're in the hands of God today. And there can be no more secure place to be than that. In John 6, in his gospel, verses 35 to 37, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you, 
that you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. And all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will in no means cast out. What have you done at salvation? You came to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're eternally secure. He will never cast you off. And the basis for eternal security is the promise of God. God said, we shall never perish. And friends, I just take God at his word. An elderly Christian lady was dying in the hospital. A friend came to see her. And the dying lady spoke of her assurance of heaven. A friend thought, well, she's been just presumptuous. So the dying lady said to her friend, If I don't make it to heaven, God will lose more than I do. Her friend asked her to explain. She said, well, if I perish, I lose only my salvation. But God will lose his honor. For he promised to give eternal life to all who have come to him through his son Jesus Christ and exercise faith. I'm not afraid of dying. My name is in the palm of his hand. Eternity cannot erase. Impressed upon its heart it remains in marks of indelible grace. She was sure of her salvation. When Jesus said in John 28, they shall never perish, he meant it. He was literally saying, they shall not, they shall not, they shall not perish. I understand that the eternal security of the believer is not embraced by all Christians. There are those who actually believe in their foolishness. They can lose their salvation. But Jesus has ruled out any possibility of someone perishing who has come to him for salvation. He was declaring that a saved person is eternally secure. I know that safe with him remains, protected by his power, what I have committed to his hands till the decisive hour. What kind of salvation would it be if it was only temporary, if it was dependent upon you, if you could lose it, it wouldn't be salvation at all. The source of eternal life, the substance of eternal life, the surety of eternal life, and the signs of eternal life. In our text, we find that John speaks of witness on the record. Actually, they're both the same word in the original. They speak of evidence. And John is telling us there is evidence that we have eternal life. Or to put it another way, if a person is saved, listen, there will be signs, there will be evidence that they are a saved person. And notice quickly, two signs of eternal life that John describes. First of all, the witness we have in our hearts. Verse 10, he who believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. There's an eternal witness that we are saved, that we have eternal life within ourselves because the Holy Spirit has come to dwell within us. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's how you know you're saved. The Holy Spirit is there bearing witness. And the word witness here, Romans 8, 16, means to jointly testify or to give evidence. If a person is saved, there's someone who dwells within them and testifies to all people that they have eternal life. Secondly, 
is the word we have in our hands. Verse 11, John speaks of the record. God has given us, and in verse 13, he speaks of the things that have been written. And these things written, and the record is, of course, God's word, the Bible. If a person is saved and has eternal life, you just go to your Bible, you study it, you ask God to lead you into all truth, and you'll see, and you know very soon you have eternal life. Let me say, when it comes to settling any doubts about having eternal life, the Bible is the source of our assurance. You can't base your salvation on the certainty of some experience that you think you've had. But you can go to the Word of God and find out the experience you really had. I once read about a preacher that was preaching. He was given his testimony as to his call to be a servant of God. Here's what he said. I was out there on the south pasture. I was plowing a field with my old mule. And all of a sudden, as I plowed, the letters PC were formed in the ground. And as I looked into the ground, I took it to be that the Lord was speaking to me, preach Christ. And after the service, he asked an older preacher, tell me, what did you think of my sermon this morning? The old preacher thought for a moment, then with a smile he said, Well, you know, the PC could have also stood for plough corn. Plough corn. I've heard people say, I know that I'm saved because I feel like I'm saved. I'll tell you what happened, lightning went through my body, or an angel came and stood at the foot of my bed. I'm not saying that when you get saved, you not know, face something special. I'm not doubting you may have a unique experience. But what I am saying is this. You cannot base your salvation on how you feel or some experience that you might have had. It's based on the Word of God and what God says. I know that I'm saved because the Bible tells me I'm saved. And I have done what God has asked me to do, that I might be saved. And throughout the book of John, we have seen that John says certain things will be true about our lives if we are saved. 1 John 2 verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2 verses 10 and 11. He that loves his brother abides in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness, and walks in darkness, and knows not whether he goeth, because the darkness has blinded his eye. 1 John 2.19 They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us, but they went out that it might be made manifest, they were not of us at all. 1 John 2, 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. 1 John 4, 13. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Blessed assurance is to be found in the Word of God. Salvation is to be found in Christ alone. It's received by faith. I want to ask you just now, are you saved? Are you sure you have eternal life? Are you rejoicing in the God of your salvation? Join his blessing day after day. I hope you are. If you're not saved, wonderful opportunity just now to come to the Savior, 
Say, Lord, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I need your salvation. And I want eternal life. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son, the Son of God, does not have life. That's the choice. You can have him, or you can rebel against him. You can receive him. You can neglect him. The choice is yours. But as you've been to the cross and put your trust in Jesus, blessed assurance, you have eternal life. Enjoy it. You're going to enjoy it for all eternity. Amen.